My name is Roy Nekwawar, and on behalf of Silk Road Heart Rate Society, I am honored to invite you to Innovations in Heart Failure Treatment Conference that will take place this Friday and Saturday on December 25th and 26, 2020. Together with these prominent speakers, we bring another conference to your mobile and desktop devices. Join us for this two days journey through latest findings and research on heart failure treatment. Register on our website to get access to this conference. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues, good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Welcome to the second day of the heart failure talks. Before we start, I would like to welcome each and every of you here joining us from the different time zones and thanks for the spending those couple hours with us. Our goal at Silk Road Heart Me Society is teaching, collaboration and sharing experience. I would like to know that you can register and become a part of Silk Road Heart Me Society on our official site Silk Road hrs.org. Speeches of conference is translated and adapted in Russian language also and is available on our email, uh, our YouTube channel. So let me talk about this in Russian language. Уважаемые коллеги, доклады этой конференции переведены на русский язык и вы можете услышать их здесь, на этой конференции, а также пош, после конференции на нашем YouTube-канале. Так что добро пожаловать. So let me introduce my co-chairs today. Our great friend from Texas, Dale Yu. He is joining us from United States and our co-chair our founder of the Silk Road Heart Rhythm Society, Farid Aliyev from Baku. Hello, Farid. Hello. Colleagues, how is things going on in your countries? What about the pandemic towards, if it's possible? <coughs> Actually, oh, we I, have I, complete lockdown they, now. So. <laughs> okay, Farid, start, please. Actually, we have complete lockdown now. Uh, for several weeks and it will continue until the end of the January as uh, expected to be so. So we, we, we have ex we experienced a difficult days uh, in our country. Dale, welcome. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you again for having me. Um, same thing, uh, these pandemic times have been very difficult. Uh, we thought we were through the worst of it, uh, but then we had our holiday Thanksgiving in, uh, in, in November, and we've uh, had the worst round of COVID deaths and sickness that I've ever seen this year. Um, unfortunately, I've, I've had personally many deaths, um, uh, colleagues and patients alike more than I've ever seen. And our, our ICUs are pretty much at max capacity at this time. So we're, we're praying that uh, Christmas and the other holidays don't make it worse. But unfortunately, we're not on lockdown. And I think that's, that's what makes it worse. But we're very thankful about the vaccine. Um, I personally got mine uh, a week and a half ago, and most of my colleagues have as well. So I hope that this starts to spread the word that it's safe and people will be able to get it accessibility and whatnot. So I, I pray that this continues to improve worldwide. Thanks, Dale. So, Professor Ali, maybe you introduce Yes, Dale sir. Yu. We're starting. So <coughs> I would like to introduce Dr. Dale Yu from the United States and invite him to make his speech about the uh, emerging therapies uh, of emer uh, emerging therapy for congestive heart failure. Please, Dr. Dale Yu. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much again for this invitation. This wonderful our failure meeting. Um, I, I was very honored and delighted to be able to uh, co-chair and present 
uh, here at this meeting, even if it's from many, many thousands of miles away uh, via the new normal, which is Zoom. Um, I definitely like to take a moment and reflect on this very ar arduous year, um, given especially since uh, we frontline workers at hospitals and clinics alike have never experienced something like this before. And, and most likely been close to somebody who has died uh, in our arms or around us uh, this year as well. So again, um, thank you so much to everybody that's online and in person, being able to take time out of your very, very important schedules to join us for this important meeting. And uh, hopefully we can continue to share on these important topics on heart failure as we know that COVID has been taking its toll. Heart failure continues to take its toll in the background as well. And that's probably why it's a topic so dear to my heart. So um, I hope you enjoyed this talk as well as the rest of day two. All right. Thank you so much for the kind invitation to this wonderful worldly international meeting on heart failure therapies. I am very uh, delighted to bring a topic close to my heart, the merging therapies and algorithms for heart failure. But I also want to take a, a moment of your time to really thank you for doing what you do, being first line responders, working in the hospitals and taking care of patients during this pandemic has brought us closer together than anything ever has in, in mankind, at least in recent recollection. So again, I think topics such as heart failure are very important because they continue to allow us to advance the therapies for morbidity and mortality reduction. Uh, and again, it is, it is my pleasure and honor to bring a topic dear to my heart in order to hopefully advance our arena of heart failure to improve those therapies for these patients as well. Uh, I am Dale Yu. I come from Dallas, Texas in the United States. I am a cardiac electrophysiologist with close ties and passion for heart failure therapies. And again, I'm delighted to bring you this topic today. Here are my disclosures. Overall, a couple of slides to really introduce you to the impact of heart failure and what it really does mean. It doesn't really matter what country in the world that you are in. It directly impacts us and our loved ones and the patients we see every day. Um, we understand that heart failure comes in many different forms. And often acute heart failure is what we see in the hospital, but chronic heart failure is the issue that we face on a day-to-day -day basis, especially from our clinics. We know that we all start asymptomatically in New York Heart Association Class 1. And then over time, we do progress rapidly between the different stages as these things can change, not only on a daily basis, but really hour to hour. Our goal ultimately is to minimize these collapses in heart failure exacerbations, as I call it. We really want to minimize the number of times that we are hospitalized and minimal, minimize the number of times that we have to be on uh, acute changes of medications in order to bring us back to our normal. As we know that as each one of these humps occur, it brings us closer and closer to a state that is closer to death than that of life itself. It provides a very a huge burden to the economic barriers uh, around the world, not only in the U.S., but all over the globe. Um, it has an impact that's so great that it's the largest part of our health care dollars spent uh, from the GDP. In the United States, it's the number one cause of hospitalization for all patients over 65. It is also the number one cause of hospitalization in the entire developed world. Total cost of heart failure in the United States alone is projected to be almost $100 billion dollars in the next 10 years. We know that a quarter of these patients are readmitted within the first 30 days of initial hospitalization, and over half of them are readmitted within six months. And the United States hospitals will lose an average of about $1.2,000 per admission that each patient comes to the hospital with. Despite medical advances, heart failure hospitalization is worsening and continues to be an epidemic as well. There's significant reduction in coronary deaths. However, there's a significant increase in heart failure hospitalizations. It is actually the number of hospitalizations with heart failure as it goes up that increases the mortality rate as well. Again, 
looking at the goal of heart failure management, we want to slow disease progression by preventing decompensation. We also know that each event accelerates the downward spiral of myocardial function. So with each subsequent heart failure related admission, a patient leaves the hospital with a further decrease in their cardiac function in itself. As we again approach a state where we're so morbid that we are bed bound and then again very close to death itself. Our ultimate goal is to maintain fluid volume changes to avoid acute decompensation and hospitalization using proven drug and device therapies. This is one of my favorite slides because as an engineer uh, by trade, uh, it's a passion of mine to determine why heart failure occurs from a mechanistic standpoint and a physiologic standpoint. And this slide really illustrates the complexity of the actual physiology that it takes for the heart to actually contract. And so when weakness occurs, it doesn't occur in one plane, it's occurring in three dimensions because there is the twisting action of the heart, the twisting action of the cone in itself, it twists one direction for contraction, and it untwists in another direction as it relaxes. So of course, this three-dimensional twisting and unloading action makes it very difficult to understand how exactly we can benefit it from a mechanistic standpoint when, it talks, when we're talking about device therapy. We all are trying to elicit the best possible response for each patient. Ultimately, taking patients that don't respond to therapies that are state-of-the-art such as CRT, make them potentially responders, and if we're lucky, make them super responders. Of an algorithm that I've kind of, kind of come up with over the last decade or two is a simple one in determining how this patient who is ultimately on a biventricular or has a biventricular device inside you, but is still decompensated, understand why that's occurring and what next to do as they are having state-of-the-art equipment and therapies done for them. Simple thing is always to check a two-view x-ray. I like to also make sure that the EKG shows that the QRS is as narrow as possible. We also do device interrogation to make sure that biventricular pacing is above 95% and that it's done in a timely way. We often want to look at other modalities in terms of being able to optimize that potentially with echocardiograms if we can do that as well. We also want to check the actual lead positions. After looking at an x-ray, if we happen to be in the operative suite or the EP lab, and we're actually going to modify this patient's lead position, we want to see where it is, and we want to identify a place where it could be better. Understanding that electrical separation with QLV is much more important than anatomic location. Also understanding what kind of leads that there are on the system, whether or not you planted them or not, we want to know what we have, what is our hardware, and what is out there, and which one is the best. Is it a bipolar lead? Is it a quadpolar lead? And who knows, in the near future, we may have octopolar leads. The more leads aren't necessarily the better thing, and the more electrodes not necessarily the better thing, but the having more options is a better thing. It allows us to find exactly what is necessary and best for that particular patient. We'll get into it in a few slides, but ultimately there are many algorithms that have come out recently to also help us maximize the efforts that CRT technology has been able to bring our patients over the last couple of decades. That includes both multipoint and CKV or adaptive CRP, CRT from a Medtronic standpoint as well. There's also non-CRT therapies out there. Um, I have had the pleasure and honor of being able to teach in numerous countries over the last several years for APAC and other societies. While doing that, I've really had my eyes really opened wide as I see what's available. It's not always biventricular therapies that are available. Not only that it isn't physically available, but from an economic state and status standpoint, the patient and their family could not afford it. So therefore, pacemakers, the basic varieties are what is left, which has brought us closer and closer to the two hot topics lately, which is his pacing and left bundle brain spacing. And I know that at least his pacing therapies are, gonna, are being discussed at this conference. And I feel it is a very important topic to do so as this may be an alternative method of reducing heart failure and treating it without necessarily putting a biventricular device in place. As mentioned above, anatomic placement is ineffective 
for finding the best spot. And when we're looking at the mated CRT trial, we saw that it didn't matter if physiologically uh, or anatomically, it looked like this was going to give you the physiologic best location because there was a nice middle or high lateral location that looked like it was separated by quite the distance to the RV apex where the lead of the RV lead is. But ultimately, knowing that that separation exists is not enough to give us what we're trying to achieve, which is the op ultimate optimization and synchronization of CRT. So what we have found is increasing electrical delays and finding a QLV is actually more suitable and more efficient in terms of finding optimal sites for uh, synchronization. When we look at QLV, again, the electrical delay between the RV lead and the LV lead, kind of looking back at that slide we talked about, the engineering slide, about the unloading and loading of the conical heart, when you understand that, you also understand that there is an, is uh, an isotropic conduction, and that often will affect which strands and which muscle fibers, and which plane will contract. And then if you want to complicate that further, when you have intramyocardial scar, whether it's something due to a genetic abnormality, or if it's an infiltrative disease, or if it's from myocardial infarction, an infarct from the past that causes a true structural barrier there, it doesn't really matter, but understanding that there are so many different ways that cause these barriers, physiologically speaking, just looking at an x-ray or looking at a fluoroscopy often is not enough. You need to understand that these barriers may make it so that electrical conduction has to go way around the corner in order to get back to where it needs to go. And that's unpredictable when looking at an x-ray. Also looking at the slide, I want you to appreciate the fact that the longer the QLV, the better the ultimate outcome. And that makes sense because the ultimate QLV would suggest that there is severe electrical dissociation, hence synchronization is out of place. If you can get your QLV over 120 milliseconds, that gives you the best response. Actually, a QOL response, quality of life's response, nearing 70% or over just over 70%. Your LV and systolic volume also responds to this as well, showing that there is remodeling potential when you do fix these synchronization issues. When you are above 120 milliseconds with a QLV, you have a left ventricular style, uh, and systolic volume response rate of 68% as well. So I think I'd belabor the point, but just to really drive this point home, because I think it's an important one, CRT therapies, which has to date been the gold therapy or platinum therapy for heart failure patients that have been refractory to medications, understand that it is not purely mathematical and not purely visual, as we mentioned earlier. And as such, we have other reasons why we need other ways to help us manage it. And this kind of brings it into the world of algorithms. We've kind of touched on it earlier, but changes in intrinsic activation, scar, block, whether it's absolute or functional, and conduction variables in our anisotropic conduction, these are all complex factors to take into place when we're talking about optimization of therapies. So I'd like to start with multipoint pacing, as this was one of the first landmark, really, trials and therapies that came out in terms of algorithmic ability to help CRT patients that are non-responding. That's a mouthful. But the goals of multipoint pacing really is to pace from two LV sites separately <clears throat> and, and actually contracting the tissue that's closest to it. That recruits more tissue altogether and suggests that you can synchronize the tissues better as well. This hopefully will improve the pattern of depolarization, hopefully will engage areas around the scar tissue, improve hemodynamics, and as I said before, resynchronization depends on this as well. So when you ask yourself, can multipoint pacing improve response in patients receiving conventional CRT? Well, there have been some studies, several that have been very small, but ultimately asking this question and immediately responding with a yes really opens your eyes because what it tells you is that not only physiologically can we, uh, can we help the heart and heart failure with putting in new hardware and leads and putting them in different places, we can also activate algorithms that are also able to help us. So when you look at this trial, this small trial looking at the 
patients with conventional CRT, and then 12 months out, adding multi-point pacing algorithms on, what you saw are the patients that improved, improved more. Patients who didn't improve, improved at that time. So it suggests that patients that even after remodeling can benefit further with algorithmic changes such as this. Also understanding that there was a vast improvement in New York Heart Association class, as well as left ventricular and systolic volume. And ultimately that's reflective in ejection fraction as well. So going back to our, our motto, or I guess our, our desire in terms of helping heart failure patients, we wanna convert non-responders to responders in the shortest amount of time as possible. Looking at another study of 506 patients, we took patients that had traditional BIV implants. We did this for three months. We also evaluated their echoes and determined to see if there was much improvement with CRT. We randomized them to be able to have traditional BIV versus having the multi-point algorithm turned on. When you took at that, when not only if they had multi-pacing, a multi-point pacing on, and we also separated that group into those that had farther separation of the two sites that were activated, and also a delay between activation between the two sites allowed for sequential twisting of the heart, you saw that you had a 100% responder rate if you allowed for more than 30 millimeter separation between the two sites, and a delay of five milliseconds, which is very small, but enough to allow you to have these wonderful benefits. And when you bring Star the Frank Starling curve in and start, start looking at pressure volume loops, what you'll notice is you actually have remodeling and entire conformational change allows you to shift that whole curve from one side to the other. The benefit you get is not only acute, also chronic, but it also changes various parts of this, of this curve, and you can see the improvements because of the algorithm in itself. The second algorithm I'd like to talk about is SYNC-AV, uh, analogous in many ways to adaptive CRT as well, which I'll talk about within this. Um, one of them is from Abbott, that's the SYNC-AV, and Medtronic has the adaptive CRT, both revolutionary algorithms to allow for not only synchronization between different sites of muscle in the ventricles, but also allowing for native conduction from top to bottom to help us fuse that to synchronization of the ventricles as well. It's a novel idea and honestly a wonderful one at that. And of course, not necessarily one that can be done in complete heart failure patients, but for our majority of our patients who don't have complete heart block, but have heart failure, they would benefit from this. So understanding that there definitely is value in allowing for delivery of fusion of conduction from your native conduction system, whether or not it's left bundle branch block or right, but mostly left bundle benefits more, and fusing this to contraction that's forced and timed from the bottom chamber as well. When you take a look at this, and when you take a look at the sync AV algorithm and understand why it would work, we're essentially fusing it from top to bottom, left to right, back to front. As I said, the heart is a three-dimensional structure and maximizing its efforts from three different dimensions will hopefully give us the best outcomes as these studies have said. CRT in itself has been wonderful over the decades that we've had it to us, but it really pales in comparison to what we should be able to achieve with the therapies, algorithms, and technologies we have these days. Also understand that QRS abbreviation is not always ubiquitous with nominal programming, which is out of the box programming that we often see, but it is facilitated by an automatic dynamic device based algorithm to accommodate variability as there is intrinsic AV interval delays and changes with time, hormones, again, electrolytes, and potentially even physiological changes. For example, if you're just waking up from bed, your AV delays may be longer. And if you're gonna go run up the stairs or run a, jo run a in a marathon or go outside and just do your normal exercise, you'd expect that to narrow up as you have to increase the heart rate and those refractory periods are also gonna button up and get smaller. So understanding that and in integrating that physiologic change is also very important, which is what SYNC-AV has been able to do. 
Going back to adaptive CRT, there are two commercially available algorithms that allow the periodic repetitive adjustments of the CRT pacing according to, again, the intrinsic AV conduction systems that we talked about. The few differences are here. Adaptive CRT preferentially delivers LV fusion pacing and is restricted to the patients with PR intervals of less than 200 milliseconds. And it also does not permit individual programming. It is the first algorithm that did come out along these lines. And usually the first ones are the ones that may make a huge splash in the, in the waters. But we like to think as further algorithms come out, second ones, third ones, and fourth ones, that we do a better job optimizing those algorithms as well. And I believe SyncAV did a good job with that. Knowing that SyncAV permits biventricular and left ventricular pacing and seeing which one's better. And also allowing for some wide AV programmability as it does allow for patients to have first degree AV blocks all the way up to 300 milliseconds as well. And also works to make a check every 256 beats. It extends the pace and sends AV delays for three beats and then measures again to make sure it is optimized for that physiologic change at that time. When you look at multi-center meta-analysis and SYNC-AV, what you'll notice is that it isn't the LV fusion pacing or LV only that is the best. And in fact, this was done because adaptive CRT had shown that LV fusion pacing was so wonderful and amazing, which it still is. But to take that one step further and figure out which type of pacing algorithm would help the best, that was done with this meta-analysis. And as you can quickly see here, the best one was with BIB pacing and SYNC-AV algorithms that were optimal, not necessarily predefined set of 50 milliseconds out of the box. This study also showed uh, a nice effect, not only in the ischemic cardiomyopathy population, but also non-ischemic, which is an area always in hot contention, is we're not always certain to know how they behave, how they got there, and if they're gonna be benefit as much as the patients that had ischemic heart failure in itself. When you take a look at the distribution again more in detail, what you'll notice is that one group, group three, the one that did BIV pacing and optimizing the AV delays to allow for the best bang for your buck as so to speak. What you'll notice is there also was not one patient in that group that actually did worse in terms of the QRS shrinking. Cure restoration was less in every single patient. However, in all the other groups, whether it's LV fusion or just by the pacing with an out of the box 50 millisecond AV delay, regardless of what that is, there was at least one, two, three, or four patients in each of these other groups that did worse with the program, which is often something we see in clinic. We think we did the best we can, and then once in a blue moon, you'll have a patient that actually does worse and you have to turn off the LV lead. So that brings us to other types of pacing algorithms, not really algorithms as much as methodologies. His pacing, again, has been around for quite a while, but in recent years has come more in vogue and something that I've done as well. And I think with the His Pro sheet from Abbott, we're gonna have a revolutionary change and shift in our thought process when we bring patients to the lab that are on borderline heart failure or that have heart failure, and we wanna determine how best to treat them. Understanding, and again, I uh, appreciate the other uh, talks at this conference um, highlighting the importance of his pacing, especially as we learn more and more about it. When we pace with his pacing, we do want to have selective capture as opposed to non-selective capture. However, talking to my colleagues and experts in this field, we still will settle on non-selective capture as we do believe that's still better than having none of that and doing traditional RV pacing with a huge QRS uh, widening as well as dyssynchrony from the RV uh, pacing in itself. What we tried to surmise at a mechanism, uh, which is also up for debate in some arenas, um, is due to a few different uh, thought processes. One is reversal due to distal pacing um, that allows you to bypass the bundle that's broken. Another one is reversal due to remote electrical activation. Um, and then lastly is one that's due to close proximity to a high septal branch, enough energy comes out that you're capturing pretty much everything around it as well. Left bundle branch pacing is another methodology taking his pacing to one more step further. Um, I know in a couple of countries I've visited, this has become quite popular, including China and India a little bit more as well. Um, it obviously makes sense in that patient that has a left bundle branch block, 
is not a candidate or either financially or mechanistically for biventricular pacing to do left advanced pacing and, and uh, proving that there is benefit with uh, resynchronization and narrowing of the QRS to normal QRS. It definitely is an area that has piqued my interest and an area that I want to learn more about. As I have demo I've seen it, I've been able to be part of it and plant it as well. I still think there's a lot we need to know in terms of the safety, its dislodgement, its burrowing into the left ventricle, um, potential scarring in that area. There are things that we don't know yet, but we do know on, um, on the times that we've done it and those hands that are good at doing it that it does narrow that QRS quite substantially and has shown positive reinforcements in terms of remodeling of the heart as well. So before moving on to just two other things um, for heart failure, uh, emerging technologies and so on and so forth, I wanna start with a case study that will illustrate the point uh, for me as well. So you take a 62 year old female with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, diagnosed about four years prior with the traditional risk factors we see, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, hypertension, it's hospitalized quite a bit every year has a dual chamber ICD implanted. The QRS wasn't wide enough at the time. However, uh, followed by AFib ablation six months later, noticed that there was the left bundle branch block, did well for 12 months, but then had more AFib, and that exacerbated the heart failure issues as well. We ultimately did an AV node ablation and did a CRTD upgrade. And overall, the symptoms did improve, no hospitalizations initially, uh, but after about four months, there was a finally a hospitalization and again, for heart failure with New York Heart Association Class 3 symptoms. We tried multiple AV and VV optimizations. We also had them on Merlin. We're watching them very closely like a hawk. We had frequent clinic follow-ups and device checks. Despite all this, we couldn't stop this patient from getting admitted more than one time to the hospital that same year. So this is what we did, ultimately. What is this? you might ask yourself. Those that have implanted it or are familiar with the literature, you will note this as a cardiomems device, which I'll get into in a few slides. Current heart failure management, as we talked about, is not great. And there's a lot of reasons for that as well. And a large part of that has to do with the fact that we are trained to use symptoms and also technology and tests, labs, diagnostics, or to help us determine what's the best way to help our patients out. However, symptoms are still one of the largest thing we utilize. But the problem is, by the time you get to symptoms, you have already reached a point sometimes of no return. Decompensation is just right around the corner. You may not be able to right that ship after it's hit the iceberg. So what are some of the symptomatologic things we utilize in order to help our heart failure management? Well, they include JVP, they include hepatojugular reflex, they include listening for an S3, listening for RALS in the lungs, taking a daily weight, of course, is a big one, I think. Uh, checking a BMP if you're fortuitous enough to be able to have a lab that you can check more than once and compare that same patient's baseline BMP to one that you see in exacerbation, that'd be wonderful. Um, also being able to listen, um, you know, being able to tell intrathoracic impedance off a device is even more helpful. And then looking at heart rate variability is also another sign of impending heart failure. And being able to control that, not only see it, but understand it, is another area that we need to investigate further. So when we look at body weight and right ventricular diastolic pressure, the COMPASS trial group looked at this. The problem there is that often the body weight doesn't shift dramatically before you get hospitalized, nor does it afterwards. We obviously diarrhea patients in the hospital changing that baseline. But we're really looking at the sensitivity of just, you know, what I tell patients all the time, three to four pounds or two to three pounds weight gain over a day, that that may be enough, but it isn't. And if you're waiting for their legs to get edematous, that may be even worse surrogate. So we see that sensitivity numbers are super low, despite what we're using for that body weight correlation. Looking at the .HF trial as well, monitoring impedance with audible alert, well, it actually increased heart failure exacer uh, exacerbation and hospitalizations. We used thoracic impedance uh, guidelines from Optival at that time, looking at this trial, and that audible alert did improve mortality and actually increase hospitalizations, potentially because it's making patients worry more, but not necessarily helping them with Mortality, which is you know the surrogate that we're always trying to use. When you take a look at these graphs, you can see why. And in fact, after about a year and a half or about 15 months out, 
from this trial and randomization, you'll notice that the access arm actually had more deaths uh, than the control arm. And when you take a look at hospitalization, it is tremendously separating out from day one, really. You see it separates out and never looks back. So that's interesting as well. So when you're managing pressures to the heart failure patient, it's again, difficult to do. We, we know what we try to do. We wanna, we wanna look um, and get stable numbers. We wanna correlate this to when they are decompensating and understand what these numbers mean. We try to get them a baseline number and use a hypothesis of determining how much above and below this is meaning that their weight is up, they have heart failure coming on board, or you've overdiaries them and we need to lay off. When you looked back at that COMPASS trial we just talked about it, and which was a prospective multi-center trial again, um, looking at 274 sick heart failure patients, increases PA pressure was actually what preceded heart failure exacerbations and hospitalizations, not body weight. Body weight was pretty neutral, but really the RV diastolic pressure and filling times was really the most significant thing, which kind of perks your ears up for the cardiomems that we talked about earlier. And also you understand that chronic, chronic, higher chronic PA pressures increase the risk of future events as well. So there's the cardiomems, and it really does offer a new promise. Now, it has been out now for many years. However, it has not been available everywhere. In the United States alone, it's recently taken, uh, was taken out of the hands of many operators in, in let's say about a third of the country because the insurances from the federal government, that's Medicare, did not cover it until they realized that it really is a life-saving device that altered the landscape and also probably hurt a lot of patients out there who had severe heart failure and potentially met their demise, demise because of the fact that this device was not available to them anymore. But understanding from the trial data itself, from Champion, which is a landmark trial itself, cardamoms prevents acute decompensation, effectively lowers PA pressures acutely, lowers hospitalization rates and readmission re rates, which is very important as we talked about earlier, and improves quality of life as well. When you look at the champion clinical data, it is amazing. The effect of the pulmonary artery pressure guided therapy overall was huge in terms of lowering mortality and morbidity. We took 550 patients and they're basically randomized to these two arms. And when you're able to use the PA pressure to guide your therapies to the patients, patients just did better. And understand there's a 33% relative risk reduction in hospitalizations in the treatment arm, which was very, very impressive in itself. Furthermore, when you take a look at it, by targeting the PA pressures, the overall mean PA pressure is reduced. And as we said, that is really crucial to determining and preventing future hospitalizations in itself. So when you take a look at number needed treat from some of the landmark trials over the last couple of decades, beta blocker being at the top of the list, number needed treat to prevent one heart failure hospitalization was seven, which is not only respectable, but amazing. Aldo antagonists were seven. CRT was seven. Beta blockers from a couple other trials were a little bit higher at 15. ACE inhibitors also were important at 15. Aldo antagonists, again, from the Ephesus trial, instead of being in the Ross trial, was 16. But still, still in the same real category, that they're all super helpful. But if you look at the, B, at the bottom, PA pressure monitoring from Champion over this 18-month period showed significant in terms of significant reduction in the hospitalization rate. And the number of needed treat was less than two. So that was very, very significant. If technology can get into our hands of, our, uh, of physicians that are able to put this in patients that are the sickest, we may really, really make a huge dent in that rehospitalization number as well. Another interesting point of the CHAMPION trial was the fact that heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, again, diastolic heart failure, you wouldn't think that this would be helpful. Why would it be that helpful? In fact, it was hugely helpful. There was a 50% reduction in hospitalizations. Again, that was very, very important to understand that and know, know what was going on. And when you look at mortality data, all-cause mortality, and even in patients with the best therapy that there was at the time, which is a biventricular ICD, got added improvement with the PA pressure monitor with cardiomems. In fact, not only a small amount, it was 64% reduction. If you did, you know, you did everything you could, which was guideline directed therapies, biventricular device, and then you added the cardiomems and determined whether or not it was helpful, 
It was significantly helpful, as you see there. So look at the management of heart failure data. There's a lot of data as we have more technologies out there. And luckily with COVID and other reasons, remote monitoring has gone up. And that's something I think that is crucial because that is the future. That's something that is gonna say. But we have to know what to do with this data. And we need to be able to improve our algorithms with this data and understand how we can help ourselves. Listing a few things, including arrhythmia burden in the top chamber, in the bottom chamber, looking at PVCs, looking at BIV pacing percentages, and correlating that with a predictive model of when that patient may go into heart failure. Throwing this up here to show you that there is real-time data that is obtained from CardiMEMS. We can see exactly what their PA pressure is there, um, both systolic and diastolic, often using diastolic, as that was the gold standard in those trials. But we can see what's going on the last day, hour, week, and that's what's great. We can treat heart failure as it's happening, not in the rear view mirror, which is what we've done in the past. A couple of more examples and trending out what we collect, showing if patients are active or not and whatnot. Brings us to the last technology I wanna talk about tonight, which is HeartLogic from Boston Scientific. It is an integrated algorithm and technology that is part of their ICD platforms and their heart failure devices with the Vivant Sugar devices. It's, and because we, we knew that there needed to be something more than just what we've already mentioned. And I think if you can summarize it all and put it into a package, we want to blend physiology where it meets technology and diagnostics and then to figure out how best to treat that patient. But heart failure treatment is so reactive because symptoms are so reactive. Again, we look for signs, but the signs are often too late and then the patient gets hospitalized anyway. So when you look at heart logic, it was going to not only use what we already knew from all the other vendors and all the other devices, but it was going to use other physiologic sensors in one single composite index to figure out this patient, something's going to happen, this one not, this is what we need to do, so on and so forth. So we have that composite, and we take a look at it. We also have sensors to pick up on heart sounds, S1, S3, thoracic impedance, which is already a part of all our platforms as it is but is an important one in itself, even if it's late. Respiratory rate and volume, how much activity have they done? Are they laying in a chair all day? These are important things. And lastly, heart rate variability at night is a very important one. And kind of taking these five physiologic points and putting them into an index is actually very easy for the common person analyzing this data, as not everybody has their own specialized heart failure clinic. This is very helpful to them as well. When you looked at the multi-sense study that validated the heart logic, it had a very uh, high sensitivity, 70%, for detecting heart failure events, and more importantly, a very low alert burden, as sometimes alerts occur so often that patients may be pointed to initially, aside from the stress and anxiety they get, later they may tune in out. It's the boy who cried wolf uh, fable that we know about, and, and that is an issue because if you get desensitized to that, it does nothing for you in order to come into the clinic early enough so you can prevent a hospitalization. And again, what's also very important is time to prevent patients from getting hospitalized, give you enough time to reverse what's been going on physiologically in the patient's body. And the index here has actually in this study showed weeks advance notice of a potential heart failure event, which is amazing in itself. There also was, its ability to identify high-risk patients, the stratification there as well. It was 10 times higher heart failure event rate when it was in alert versus out alert, which makes sense, but 50 times higher when it was in alert and the pro BMP was elevated, which makes sense, but augmenting that with a simple alert system tends to make this better. There was a very low non-alert rate of 0 0.08 per year patient year, and the predictive value was very robust across a diverse subgroup of patients as we listed here. So it's exciting with what we have. The future brings us lots of new technologies and algorithms that I can't wait to incorporate into patient care. And, and, and also in the future, we want to be able to create new algorithms that incorporate what we already know, sounds, arrhythmias, and being able to bring all that together um, and also incorporating data from the device, including CoreView or Optival and other thoracic impedance with also the latest activation that you get, QLV from the LV lead. I, want, I would love to see a dynamic QLV coming up on the screen so I can understand how best to help this patient. And I would love for the device itself to be able to use QLV determining 
what it needs to activate and, to, and take that into account, but also the high threshold that may be occurring from certain, certain pulls from the lead itself. Having automatic adjustments of EV and AV, kind of in, in a way it is already occurring with sync AV, but going further with that would be amazing. Having adjustments based on cardiac output calculations, which is in the works already inside of CardioMEMS. Technology is already there, it just has been black boxed out because it wasn't FDA approved, it wasn't part of the original study, but it is hopefully coming soon. And being able to use a patient advisor module, AKA a phone really these days, um, with the apps that allow patients to assist with management. We're already seeing it with Medtronic and Abbott already with their Bluetooth devices, the remote monitoring that they don't have to plug up or put onto themselves. It, the future again is very, very bright, which brings us to my last slide and some final thoughts. We want to strive for the best possible response for all patients and then reassess them over and over again because patients change, we change. We all, the physio physiologic changes occur all the time in patients that changes the landscape. So we, we need to be diligent about it, be patient about it, and keep striving for the best and really look ahead. What is it not available today may be available tomorrow. Checking a basic two view x-ray as we talked about way back when, to make sure the LV lead is in the right spot would be wonderful. CRT optimization with echo should be done at least, you know, on that first check within the first month after getting a CRT. Usually they say within first three to six months after that. And really annually, if you're doing great, every six months or not. Looking at the different algorithms, whether it's adaptive CRT, CKV, or multipoint, these give us not only a small start, but really a good head start into the arena of heart failure therapy for difficult non-responding patients. Consider HIS and left bundle where they're needed. Um, again, CRT versus HIS or CRT versus left bundle. There are some trial data out there, but I'll say there's the, the jury is still out. And because of that, formulate your own, your own flow chart of understanding who gets what would be very important as well. Um, and then consider other devices, such as CardiMEMS, or if you haven't already put in a, a, a heart failure device for the patient, consider a heart logic device as well, as that has all those other physiologic sensors in a patient that may be ultimately refractory. Patient that's refractory to meds, may ultimately be refractory to all the traditional therapies as well from CRT. So that basically wraps it up. Um, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to this meeting and for paying attention and listening to this very important uh, conference and, and topic as well. Uh, again, it is an honor to be part of this. And uh, I, I do pray that each and every one of you continues to stay well and healthy so that we can help others as well. Um, and I hope I have the opportunity to uh, come back and uh, talk on another topic within heart failure or, or else um, or other topics as well, as uh, I do love uh, being able to be amongst my, uh, my, uh, my colleagues around the world and be able to solve um, some of the problems that we have in heart failure and other areas in, in cardiac care as well. So uh, with that, thank you very much and have a wonderful day. So Dale, thank you very much for a substantive presentation and great talk. Um, Dr. Aliyev, Dr. Yu, maybe some comments about uh, this presentation or some heart failure treatment tools and devices. Uh, Farid, I, please. I, I, don't, I can't see myself on the video. Something that's happened, I think, uh, here. Uh, thank you for, uh, you for his very informative and evidence-based uh, presentation. Actually, I have no questions about uh, this uh, issue, this topic, because the speech was very informative for us. I just want, wanted to add some points uh, regarding the emerging therapies of the heart failure and the, in the treatment and the follow-up. Because we are interventionalists, frequently forget about some medical approach, and those people who are managing medical uh, heart failure from the medical standpoint, they also they forget the, about some interventions. So the important concept here in the treatment and the patient with heart failure is, uh, as in my experience, we should not forget 
and about the cardiac rehab programs because these programs really decrease the mortality and decrease the quality of life in this group of patients and it increases much more significantly we even uh, we extensive experience with non-responders we uh, up to crt and when we engage these people to the cardiac rehab program they become responders so that we do not we should not forget about the the feeling of well-being, which in turn uh, returns with well-being again to us. So in this heart failure, it's important. I would just want to, to uh, add this uh, and thank you for a perfect presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for those insights. No, I, I appreciate those words. Absolutely. As interventionalists, sometimes we uh, are geared and focused on what we need to put in somebody and how we therapeutic, uh, therapeutically analyze that data, but absolutely um, optimi optimizing medica medications, the use of Arnie's, aldosterone, antagonists, rehab, as you've mentioned it, um, and also wanted to mention EECP, uh, uh, counterpulsation, um, I think is now starting to be used a lot more in the United States, uh, maybe even worldwide, starting to see that really be effective in uh, turning patients, not only from an angional standpoint, from an angional equivalent and heart failure standpoint as well. So uh, thank you for those uh, insightful words. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, um, I, I, I think we've checked uh, the group chatter and it, it looks like either I put people to sleep or it was very clear. Hopefully it's the latter. Um, but without further ado, I would like to, uh, to uh, pass the, the torch to my good friend and colleague and esteemed uh, chair of this uh, program, uh, Rowan uh, Rekvava. And, uh, and he has done an amazing job organizing this program. So uh, I do want to uh, pass the torch to him so he can give us some insights on cardiac resynchronization therapy and, uh, and give us his thoughts Sorry. there as well. Dear colleagues, my name is Roy Requava. I am from Research Institute for Cardiology and Internal Diseases, Almaty, Kazakhstan. I am the head of the cardiac electrophysiology department. And today I would like to talk about cardiac resynchronization therapy for heart failure. Cardiac resynchronization therapy is one of the most successful heart failure therapies. And it's applicable to 30% of patients with symptomatic heart failure. We divide cardiac desynchrony in three types, atrioventricular, intraventricular and inter interventricular desynchrony. There are an interesting correlation between prevalence of left bundle branch block and chronic heart failure. Left bundle branch block present in 8% those category of patient who has preserved ejection fraction. If your patient has an impaired ejection fraction, they have a prevalence 24% of left bundle branch block and 38% in the category of patient moderate severe chronic heart failure. And it's very interesting that relative risk is five times higher with widest QRS complex. Randomized trials are showing that CRT indication is growing. We have several expert consensus and guidelines for the CRT implantation indication. So cardiac resynchronization therapy is an established therapy for improving heart failure patient, especially with left bundle branch block. Cardiac resynchronization therapy reduces symptoms, exercise capacity, improves quality of life, echo parameters, reduce need of hospitalization and reduce mortality. In left picture, you see the 3D echocardiography of left ventricle as is, and it's very asynchronous, desynchronous contractility of, this, of left ventricle. And we see the ECG of left bundle, classical left bundle branch block. 
So after CRT implantation, you see the picture in right hand side, we have nice wall motion of the left ventricle and synchronous contractility of the myocardium, as well as narrow complex on ECG. Medit trials unite patients with classical left bundle branch block. Second group was with right bundle branch block. And third group was very interesting with interventricular nonspecific cardiac delay. So who is benefits from CRTD? Of course, patient with classical left bundle branch block. Second phase of the trial shows that CRT cardiac resynchronization therapy with defibrillation function, CRTD, was superior versus ICD in the patient with left band, classical left band or blanch block with mild heart failure symptoms. But cardiac resynchronization therapy was not superior versus the implantable cardioverter defibrillator in the patient with non-left bundle branch block. Cardiac MR is the gold standard to measure left ventricular volumes, mass, and ejection fraction. Accurate evaluation of ball motion in every left ventricular segment. Detect late gadolinium enhancement helps us for patient selection and lead positioning. In left picture, you see the patient before CRT implantation and low injection fraction 32, as well as left ventricular and diastolic and end systolic volumes are high. And right picture shows us six months after biventricular CRT implantation. And we see the ejection fraction is arising till 41 and left ventricular and diastolic and end systolic volumes became better, as well as basal septal to lateral delay and mid ventricular septal and lateral delay. Question is, is there any specific population within non left bundle branch block that may benefit from implantation of the CRTD? Yes, it is. And first, category are patients with prolonged PR interval. Probably by alternating atrioventricular mechanical sequence leading in to impaired left ventricle diastolic filling and increased myocardial infarction. So if your patient has PR interval of more than 230 milliseconds, CRT was superior versus to implantable cardioverter defibrillator. But if your patient has PR interval less than 20, 230 milliseconds, CRTD has worse mortality than implantable cardioverter defibrillator. What about cardiac resynchronization therapy in heart failure patient with narrow QRS complex? Despite of the desynchrony demonstrated by ECHO, use of cardiac resynchronization therapy associated with higher mortality in patients with narrow QRS complex. So if your patient has only echo signs of the desynchrony, but narrow QRS complex of QRS, you should not implant a cardiac resynchronization system. And highest responders of CRT implantation are patients with wider QRS complex, with classical left bundle branch block, female gender, and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Moderate responders are males and patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy. And lowest non-responders, patients with narrow QRS and non-left bundle branch block pattern. As you see, QRS duration and morphology is very important. Cardiac resynchronization therapy is recommended for the symptomatic patients with heart failure in sinus read with a QRS duration more than 115 milliseconds 
and classical left bundle lunch block. But you can consider CRT in the patients with QRS duration more 150 milliseconds and non left bundle branch block pattern. Cardiac resynchronization therapy is recommended for the patient with QRS duration between 130 milliseconds and 149 milliseconds and with classical left bundle branch block pattern. If your patient has atrial fibrillation with rapid conduction through the AV node to ventricle and QRS duration is more than 130 milliseconds, you can consider also CRT implantation and after choose the rate control strategy as well as atrioventricular nodal ablation. But CRT is strongly contraindicated with QRS duration less than 130 milliseconds. There are very interesting findings that right ventricular pacing causes desynchrony. Activation pattern in patients with left bundle branch block is the similar to right ventricular pacing. And David trial shows that each 10% increase in right ventricular pacing increase the risk of death or heart failure events by 16%. Studies with atri atrioventricular block shows us that CRT was superior to right ventricular pacing in patients with atrioventricular block and mild left ventricular systolic dysfunction. There are interesting findings that cardiac resynchronization therapy with defibrillation function is superior in patients with ischemic etiology, etiology compared to cardiac resynchronization therapy with only pacemaker part function regarding all-cause mortality, but not difference in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Let me remind you the mean number of the CRT implantation in our, our area. CRTP is 24 and CRTD 63. Let me conclude with the fact that cardiac resynchronization therapy is recommended to reduce all-cause mortality and heart failure events in mild to symptomatic heart failure patients with a QRS duration more than 130 milliseconds, with a left ventricular injection fraction less than 35%, and with left bundle branch block. Cardiac resynchronization therapy is recommended to reduce all cause mortality and heart failure events in mild or symptomatic heart failure patient with a QRS duration more than 150 milliseconds, ejection fraction less than 35%, and non-left bundle branch block and prolonged PR interval. Let me remind that CRTD is only superior to CRTP in ischemic heart failure patients. Activation pattern in patient with left bundle branch block is similar to right ventricular pacing, which causes dyssynchrony. And in average 10% of the heart failure patients are indicated for CRT implantation. Thank you very much for your attention. So we are still online. Colleagues, maybe some comments about CRT therapy, CRT indication of the patients, specific situation in your country or something else, please. Dale, Farid. I think Dale had the question. Okay. Uh, are we live? Yeah, we are live. Okay. Um, yes, uh, great, great insightful talk. I think CRT is, you know, the mainstay of, of heart failure therapy from an interventional standpoint. Um, but I do have questions about AV delays. And as, uh, as in my talk, we alluded to uh, adaptive CRT and fusion pacing as well as sync AV. Um, I guess my, my question is, at which point do you uh, sacrifice really looking at AV delays, shortening them up, and bringing somebody who may have a narrow complex but has very long AV delays and considering they'll RV pace all the time and start to consider by V pacing on that patient because you, and of course they're, they're developing heart failure symptoms, but what, what are your thoughts there? 
Yes, if the question, I understand correctly your question, uh, does every, uh, so biventricular pacing is better than are we only pacing, you mean? Right, but as you know, there there's patients where we put a dual chamber pacemaker in and we really fight over whether or not we let their AV delays get out to 400 milliseconds or higher, which we know is, a, you know, one of your slides is very nice to point that out. Uh, I, I have difficult time to know when we know we can pull the trigger and upgrade them to a biventricular pacemaker to prevent that decline in heart failure early. Um, and sometimes very difficult to even get insurance to pay for it in the U U.S. I don't know what your thoughts are and what you do. Do you wait until function has just dropped and you do AV uh, optimization with echo routinely, or do you just theoretically, you know, let them wait until it gets worse? Okay, so I will answer from the last your question. So yes, we are trying to optimize every patient with CRTD, biventricular pacing, by echo. Sometimes we have um, uh, results um, not, uh, you know, it, it's the, the um, uh, very specific, very subjective method, you know about this, and sometimes we have results at uh, Narodnikak. And um, I mean, we have results, uh, emergenous results, emergenous results. But so we are optimized oh, all patients with c CRT. Uh, about your question that uh, more than 300 milliseconds PR interval and optimization. Yes, we are trying to optimize it from uh, dual chamber pacemaker to the CRT to avoid right ventricular pacing and to, uh, to do uh, biventricular or monoventricular left ventricular pacing. But the question is, if we can, if we can pace his bundle, there is one more thing that we have, if you can, in case that we can extract the right ventricular apex electrode and insert the CRT, um, bi dual chamber pacemaker with the he stimulation, there is the option for us also. And we don't right. have, in this situation, we do not upgrade to CRT. We upgrade it to his bundle pacing. I, th I hope yes. I answer your question. No, you do. That's, oh, that's kind of similar. Um, EF hasn't dropped yet, but we know they will do poorly. Uh, his pacing has become kind of the adjunct between that and biventricular pacing. We've seen that. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. And so re have, let me introduce... Have, oh, yeah, okay. If, if we Go have ahead. a time, do we have a restriction in time? Yes. No, 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 no. You can speak. So, I have uh, questions to both of you, actually, these uh, uh, questions uh, now, uh, I have now. Uh, this uh, question about the, how do you approach to a patient if you cannot optimize AV delay in any way? So you do not have an optimal uh, echo optimization of the AV delay. How do you, do you approach to these patients? Because these patients may come, they are not so frequent, but they may come with the, as a non-responder, and how do you approach this in this case? Dale? Sure. Um, so I, I think that's an adjunct to the question I was asking as well, but uh, I think we see it quite, optim uh, quite often. Um, you know, we don't know if it's medically optimized, but we hope they are. Um, but in those patients, I, I think they have advanced AV conduction disease, septal disease, and probably starting to show signs of distal conduction disease. So I, I think these patients are the ones we consider upgrading them, um, or if they don't have, you know, once they have their dual chamber pacemakers, start to put them on the spectrum of deciding, are they going, are they heading towards, you know, having complete heart block or just extensive AV delays because of disease, then his pacing, I think, is a thought. If their ejection fractions are dropping below 50, uh, I think we start to narrow up the AV delays uh, and understand from Block HF that we are probably heading towards a biventricular pacemaker uh, in that patient at a minimum. But you know, now the tools for his pacing have become much better. Um, I would actually probably entertain the thought of the his pacing, uh, and if it is ineffective, then to bail out during the same procedure uh, and upgrade it to a bi pacemaker at the same time. I mean, our strategies. 
I mean if you cannot optimize AV delay in a CRT patient, not in- AV. Oh, I see. So uh, I, I think those patients that can't optimize in a CRT patient, um, I, I mean, I hate to do it, but I, I'm assuming they have some conduction. We'll AV note ablate them and so that it's not a part of the problem anymore. Um, if in, in rare cases in these patients, I've in a couple of cases, we've left bundle, bundle paste them. If we think they benefit from it because they started with the left bundle, we'll actually do a left bundle branch pacing. Okay, thank you. If we have not questions, let me introduce Farid Ali, Associated Professor, the director of the cardiovascular center of Baku Health Center. And his talk is ventricular tachycardia ablation in the patient with heart failure. Please, Farid. Thank you. Okay, so dear chairmen, uh, dear participants, I would like to welcome you from the Baku, Azerbaijan. My name is Farid Alif. I will uh, talk today about the VT ablation in heart failure. Uh, as you know, the heart failure is, uh, a, a, is a, the diagnosis that have uh, too many uh, groups, which include too many groups of different diseases, which result in the uh, failure of the cardiac muscle. It's frequently associated uh, with ventricular arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death also. Um, as you know, ventricular arrhythmias are common in patients with congestive heart failure and the clinical presentation range from asymptomatic incidental electrocardiographic finding to palpitation, syncope, and sudden cardiac death. It is difficult to talk about uh, in general uh, as, uh, uh, about the ablation in heart failure, because as you know, we may have on the other, on one hand, we may have a patient with ischemic cardiomyopathy. On the other hand, we can have a patient with uh, non-ischemic cardiomyopathies, including the other too many infiltrative disease, and uh, so one fits all approach is not uh, useful in this uh, entity. So I will try to talk in general <clears throat> about how to approach a patient with heart failure and to share with you uh, the available scientific evidence which is available for today. As you know, we frequently use implantable cardioverters in this uh, patient and uh, sudden cardioverters prevent uh, uh, cardioverter defibrillators successfully prevent sudden cardiac death associated with ventricular fibrillation and tachycardia. But as you know, the recurring uh, shocks remain a clinical problem in this case and uh, increasing number the shocks, increasing the cardiac and all cause mortality in this group of patients. Why should we ablate? <clears throat> and the recent uh, scientific evidence shows that we, if we planning to ablate, we should start it as early as possible uh, because repeated number of shocks pose a significant clinical challenge due to pain and hemodynamic deterioration and they are associated with increased mortality. Uh, and what we should know uh, again that ICD is not a 100% uh, guarantee uh, against the sudden cardiac death. And because one study showed that the rate of sudden cardiac death in patients with ICD is around 5%. Uh, what are the options other than RF ablation? Uh, we will not talk about them today. Uh, we will talk about some of them in a uh, limited amount, but uh, as you know, it's an antiarrhythmic drug therapy, sedation and anesthesia in acute setting, stellate ganglia ablation or surgery, left ventricular assist devices and V-ventricular assist devices, the heart transplantation, alcohol ablation through the coronary arteries, and uh, recently available no-touch ablation uh, techniques. This is a general picture of a patient with uh, heart failure undergoing RF ablation. 
uh, frequently these patients have either electrical storm for today or uh, incessant ventricular tachycardia necessitating the uh, <clears throat> intervention, uh, necessitating our intervention. And this is the basic what we need, the fluoroscopy, the 3D electron atomic mapping system and the conventional mapping system. Uh, as you all uh, frequently face the this clinical entity, there is too many leads, wires inside uh, in the heart and <clears throat> this patient previously probably stented patients at previous cardiac surgery, including coronary surgery and uh, valvular surgery also. So it's a very uh, complicated picture here, as you see. <clears throat> when we will go to results of the today available clinical trials of beta ablation in patients with heart failure, this uh, two-year follow-up result of the SMASH VT trial, uh, which shows that there is decrease in appropriate uh, therapy in appropriate shocks and slight decrease in mortality <clears throat> in these patients. So, uh, but as we will talk later, we'll see that as early we plan the ablation in this group of patients, then uh, so the better the results. Uh, this result of the VTAC trial, the trial of catheter ablation of stable ventricular tachycardia before a defibrillated implantation. This is a multi-center randomized controlled trial. And you will see that in general, the ejection fraction of these patients is around uh, 30, 30, 35% in both group ablation and the control groups. And the patient of uh, and the proportion of patients with left ventricular ejection fraction less than thirty percent in this group. It's about forty percent for the in the both groups. Uh, what we see on the left panel on the left side, we see that uh, here there's a survival rate from VT and VF in ablation group is higher uh, than in the control arm. But when we compare results of sub data analysis of these patients, we will see that uh, survival uh, from VTVF in patients with a left ventricular ejection fraction less than 30% uh, is not different from the control group and left ventricular ejection fraction in patients with left ventricular ejection fraction of more than 30%, uh, the ablation groups is much more better results of ablation groups uh, from point of survival from V10 VF is much more better. So <clears throat> it's uh, this result. If we interpret this result, to show that we should plan an ablation in this group in this arm uh, maybe earlier when the ejection fraction is not so low <clears throat> and is not below the uh, thirty percent. So. Uh, and other trials also show us, we will we'll discuss later, that the, uh, as the ejection fraction falls, the results are also not encouraging. This is the result of uh, catheter ablation in ventricular tachycardia using cooled frequency energy, this trial. And what is interesting here, it shows that uh, time during the follow-up, about 400 uh, days, the freedom from VT recurrence is very low in this group. And this trial also important from that point that uh, it, it, this patient did not, were, were not on the uh, antiarrhythmic drug therapy after that, after uh, ablation. And the cumulative survival of the patients is also very low. The number of complications, about 8% of major complication uh, in this group uh, was reported and the percentage of uh, minor complications, about 6%. Uh, another trial which included patients with left ventricular ejection fraction of around 30 is a uh, irrigated radio frequency uh, catheter ablation of sustained tachycardia thermocool VT trial. This trial also showed that there is a significant decrease in the frequency of VT after ablation and the <clears throat> long-term outcome percentage of ICD shocks 
uh, was also low even uh, very after a very long period of time and the all cause mortality also was low and the uh, number of ICD shocks and ICD therapies were also lower in the ablation groups. Also uh, the hospitalization uh, rate was also low in their ablation groups. Uh, this is another trial comparing the two strategies of escalation of antiarrhythmic drug therapy versus uh, ablation of ventricular tachycardia. And uh, this, uh, this trial showed that no difference actually in primary outcome in deaths in ventricular tachycardia storm and appropriate ICD therapy. So when interpreting these different results of different trials, we should uh, understand that the, uh, the homogeneity of the group of patients included of tr in the trial should be considered, the experience of the centers should be considered, the experience of the operators should be considered when interpreting uh, these tr uh, trial results. Uh, <clears throat> this is a retrospective study comparing the outcome of patients with near half four, class 4 heart failure, uh, neurocustation class 4 heart failure, uh, to, with the patients of uh, class 2 and 3 heart failure. Uh, this, as you know, the patients with class 4 heart failure are generally considered as not a good candidate for the ablation therapy. As a result of these patients are not good. Uh, and the complication, expected complication rate is high. But, but this retrospective trial uh, showed that there is some patient may benefit for the, uh, from the ablation therapy. And <clears throat> when we compare this group of patients, we will see that patients with class four heart failure actually have a higher number of implanted ICDs and higher number of uh, ICD therapies and incessant VT and also they have a high number of antiarrhythmic drug therapy when compared to class two and three heart failure. What are the results of this trial? Also, uh, the use of hemodynamic support was higher, a need for hemodynamic support during the ablation procedure was higher in patients with class four heart failure. And also the need for cardiac transplantation was higher in this group. And the time for VT recurrence was shorter in class four heart failure patients. And when we see, see to the picture this showed in this slide, uh, we will see that uh, survival is significantly decreased when compared to class three, class four heart failure patients. Uh, and also uh, we will we'll see that <clears throat> if the patient has a successful, if the patient with class four heart failure has the successful VT ablation, the survival of these patients is very close to the class two and three patients which who has a recurrence. So uh, results of this trial should be interpreted as if we have uh, an early recurrence of VT after ablation or failed VT ablation, these patients are, uh, have not, do not have a good prognosis. They actually have a very bad prognosis. <clears throat> How can we uh, improve the results? So when we dealing when we deal with the, the patients with heart failure, uh, we must aim some uh, target points, which should include the shortest procedural time, uh, shortest mapping time, fast mapping, high density mapping, uh, hemodynamic support, as we'll talk later. So this is one of the the techniques, the HD grid catheter. We also have other fast mapping systems uh, today and other high density mapping system like Pentaray. Uh, so this slide shows that we should use this high density mapping system. We should consider they are used in patients with, especially when they uh, previously failed ablation 
or uh, difficult ablation and the patient in the patients with a very uh, <coughs> high uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a patient with a scar tissue. So uh, <clears throat> another important point in these patients with heart failure is uh, hemodynamic support because we know that these patients are prone to the hemodynamic compromise during the procedure. Uh, we can use intra-aortic balloon pump. We can use some impeller device, tandem heart, uh, ECMO devices for hemodynamic support as you see from this slide. And <clears throat> we know that uh, if this is, if we have a patient with intra-aortic, if you use the intra-aortic balloon pump, actually we use it in a patient with lower, actually uh, with lower risk of hemodynamic compromise. In other group, we have to use the other non uh, intra-aortic balloon pump techniques like an impella and tandem heart. And uh, when should we implant this device? And the result of one of the trials showing us that the important point here, uh, important predictor of mortality in this group of patients is the ejection fraction uh, for the in-hospital mortality of these patients. And in-hospital mortality is the highest in the patients with left ventricular ejection fraction uh, lower than 15 percent, and uh, when we take uh, when we consider what are the predictors of long-term mortality, uh, on the long-term mortality we see that the presence of implanted previously implanted CRTD device and number uh, and stay in the intensive care unit before the ablation procedures were considered as a predictors of uh, late mortality in this group of patients. So when should we suggest uh, using the inotropic in mechanical support and other hemodynamic support in this group of patients? This is a study of from the, in the lower part of the slide, you see the results of the study from the Sant'Agnelli group which showed that interesting, because this finding from this study was uh, actually uh, in contrast to the expected hemodynamic deterioration in their study <coughs> uh, was more frequent uh, during uh, pace mapping and during pacing maneuvers uh, and in sinus rhythm, in the mapping during sinus rhythm. Actually, uh, during uh, slow VT, activation mapping during slow VT was not associated with hemodynamic compromise. And this is the score derived from their study showing that the higher the scores, the higher the probability of hemodynamic pro compromise during the procedure. And those, if we have a high risk patients, so uh, the patient, if the patient has actually more than 17 points from this score, uh, they need to be prepared to uh, hemodynamic support before the procedure. It should be considered because during the procedure, unplanned hemodynamic support also may not be feasible and may not be possible in, uh, uh, at all times. And later I will show you the reasons for that. <coughs> what are the, in this slide you see the, possible frequently used techniques, the intraortic balloon pump, the impeller device, tandem heart, and ECMO techniques. Each technique has its own, or its own advantages, limitations, and contraindications. So we should consider it uh, in an individual patient before <coughs> planning the procedure. Uh, this is an overall results of all hemodynamic support during VT. Uh, studies uh, showing in general that <clears throat> uh, these are the high risk group of patients and uh, uh, earlier preparation for the uh, hemodynamic support should be considered especially in the critically ill patients. Uh, <clears throat> why it's important because why, why should we consider it early? Uh, first, the most important thing here is uh, 
pre-procedural preparation and the presence of the experienced team. So uh, when we're planning this kind of procedure with hemodynamic support, with when we're planning the HIP hybrid procedure with surgeons and vascular surgeons, so too many staff in the lab, you have to have a large uh, EP lab for that to uh, accommodate all these devices and all these staff. Uh, for example, here you see the team needed for this kind of intervention, which includes interventional cardiologists, cardiothoracic surgeons, vascular surgeons, cardiac anesthetists, perfusionists, lab and theater nurses, MAP and EP technicians, and in intensive care unit stand, uh, staff. From the point of equipment, you need a periprocedural, uh, first preprocedural imaging, post you need periprocedural imaging, which includes transesophageal echocardiography or intracardiac echocardiography, 3D mapping, a mapping device, ablation device, ECMO pump or percutaneous mechanically support uh, devices, vascular clamps, proglides, cerebral, ox uh, cerebral oximetry monitoring, pericardiosynthesis equipment. So you have to accommodate this lab for large and mm, uh, high number of devices and also the uh, big, it's suitable for the big staff. So it, this procedure is better to uh, program before the planning the case. Uh, and the outcome also will be better in the planned procedure other than when it performed on an emergency basis. <clears throat> and actually, there are some questions that really is the juice worth the squeeze? Uh, because result, as uh, despite everything, the results are not very encouraging in patients with very uh, low ejection fraction. So it's better to consider the earlier transport, trans, uh, transplantation or other mechanical, long-term mechanical uh, support devices uh, in this group of patients. But frequently we face with this kind of patients. Another possible, uh, one of the possible techniques is the transcoronary ethanol ablation of recurrent tachycardia. And this slide shows that uh, transcoronary ethanol ablation is feasible uh, in patients with failed radiofrequency ablations. Uh, but we should understand how you can, you can see that from the lower uh, left part of this <coughs> algorithm that maybe Sometimes these procedures may perform as radiofrequency ablation failed, failed. Uh, you may have the failed radiofrequency ablation, thereafter you may have failed transcoronary ethanol ablation in the same patient, and thereafter you may have a successful RF ablation. This actual, this, uh, this picture shows it that some patients fail after first ablation, after transcoronary ethanol ablation, and they, uh, may benefit from the next radiofrequency ablation. So everything depends also on the operator uh, and the center also. <clears throat> uh, so uh, what in general we have, we have to understand that results of VT ablation are better for ischemic heart disease and we should consider the catheter ablation uh, in preference to escalating antiarrhythmic therapy in the ischemic heart disease. And also, uh, we should consider uh, ablation in patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, but <clears throat> we must understand that ablation in the non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, uh, the results of ablation in this group of patients is not, uh, we may need some additional techniques including epicardial ablation. We should plan maybe some uh, combined approach in individual patients uh, with endocardial, including endocardial and epicardial ablation during the same procedure. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sure when, if we're planning epicardial ablation, a patient hemodynamic support, first we have to obtain an uh, Epicardial, uh, epicardial approach. And <clears throat> for patients with bundle branch reentrant, we should consider 
the ablation uh, earlier if we face with bundle branch reentrant VT. For recommendations for the preprocedural imaging uh, of ventricular uh, arrhythmias, uh, including cardiac MRI studies, uh, should be performed before ICD implantation. Most of the patients uh, to reduce the uh, MR associated cardiac MRI associated artifacts uh, associated with ICD uh, and uh, hemodynamic support in the patient needs hemodynamic support. It, uh, the decision should be, be based on the uh, decision of the advanced heart failure specialists, and uh, if possible, it should be done before the procedure. This, if you take uh, planning this kind of intervention. In the conclusion, we can say that catheter ablation of VT is an effective treatment for VT, and it can be easy, it can be safely performed in patients with advanced heart failure. And lack of recurrence among these patients is associated with improved survival. Uh, Neurocarcassation class four patients with VT recurrence before, within the first 30 days has a more than eightfold increased risk of death in a year compared with similar patients who do not have early recurrence. Early recurrence of VT after ablation in neurocarcassation for patients is strongly associated with subsequent mortality and should prompt consideration for advanced heart failure therapies, including cardiac transplantation and uh, long-term mechanical support. Substrate-based ablation can be useful in a case of hemodynamically uh, unstable VTs and ventricular fibrillation. More intense mapping system can shorter procedural times and lead to increase in procedural success. And use of percutaneous left ventricular assist devices during ablation in selected cases uh, can help to minimize the hemodynamic compromise associated with the procedure. So this is the end of my presentation. I thank you all for your attention. So Farid, thank you very much for your presentation. Very interesting presentation. Uh, dear colleagues, let me announce that Professor Ali Otto joined us from Ankara Hospital. Hello, Professor Otto. Hello. Good morning, good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have several time zones. Thank you very much yeah, to join indeed, us. Yes. Let me ask the question for our audience or for Farid Aliyev. Um, uh, I don't see the question. So uh, when ventricular abrasion therapy to avoid is the interesting question from cardiologists, I think. Maybe Dale, Farid, Professor Otto, please. said before, it's, uh, 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 do you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Uh, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, uh, this topic is very, uh, it's not a very uniform. So uh, ablation heart failure is a very wide, has a very wide range of uh, approaches. So it depends on the underlying pathology that we're dealing with. And uh, when we no, should not ablate, or sure we should not ablate if we have some uh, reversible causes of the tachycardia. But when we, when we talk about the heart failure, actually a heart failure patient, so we sh maybe we should ablate in any case that we think that the patient will take uh, some benefit from it. Sometimes we face with a patient with a very low ejection fraction, with a very, um, I would say, bad, the initially bad prognosis. But if we if we will succeed in the ablation procedure, this patient's benefit from the procedure. So we should not uh, approach it from the beginning as okay, this patient will not benefit. We may not know the effective approach, will, she, will he benefit or not? So if you do not have reversible any causes, uh, the metabolic causes and other things, so you can do ablation any, in any of these patients. And as you know, from our experience that even if we cannot manage this patient with radiofrequency ablation, uh, we try in this patient the 
uh, stellate ganglion ablation bilateral in very, very, very compromised patients. And we do well with this in this group of high risk patients also. So my approach is to ablate whenever it's possible in the heart failure and uh, if we, just reversible causes is contraindication. Yeah, uh, well, I really um, echo what uh, Farid said, but uh, I would like to emphasize that, you know, there are two, three options. The first one is, of course, um, if uh, you can detect any, any kind of reversible cause, Second, if there is any space for, for uh, drugs, you know, to add on, uh, sometimes uh, we add the uh, ranulazine and uh, it is um, helpful uh, the, on top of the antiarrhythmics. And the, of course, third is if, you know, ventricular arrhythmia uh, does not cause any hemodynamic compromise and, uh, you know, it's very, short duration, and then you can wait for, for ablation. Interesting. Thank Otherwise, you. Uh, uh, colleagues, what about this? You may have to give chance, chance to the patient. OK, thank you for your answer. What about the, your, quickly your strategies about substrate ablation or uh, ablation on VT, ongoing VT? I mean, in terms of uh, uh, patients non-ischemic and ischemic cardiomyopathy. Dale, please. Yes, um, I, I, I was just about to actually say that as a good segue. Um, I was also going to uh, ask to see what you guys do in terms of imaging, but um, what I try to do more and more uh, is see if we have any imaging from prior from terms of MRIs. Obviously, if patients already have defibrillators in situ, it makes it a little bit difficult because even if we do the MRI, you have some shielding, uh, and some artifact issues from that. Um, but from a substrate standpoint, it's very interesting to me uh, because we obviously will start with an endocardial ablation, uh, also looking to see if they're monomorphic versus um, monomorphic from multiple different sites, or does it degenerate easily to polymorphic VT and really study to figure out where the first and primary VT is coming from, where the zones of ischemia are. And also, intriguingly enough, on non-ischemic um, being being a little bit more aggressive. I, I know I appreciated that talk and saw those slides as well uh, in terms of non-ischemics potentially not having as much benefit. Um, however, I, I think we're, we have a movement towards uh, intervening earlier because the therapies uh, themselves have become uh, much easier to do with less morbidity. And actually, um, we've actually moved towards doing more epicardial ablation, not as a first line, but definitely on a second or third line um, and bringing them back much before we do alcohol ablation uh, or even say a stellar ganglion. And I think the stellar ganglion, uh, we, we do do it um, on rare uh, occasions, uh, but uh, availability of surgeons that are uh, good enough to be able to uh, aid us in that venture, as well as the, uh, I guess, ease on doing epicardial ablation has become better with the tools we have. Um, so extensive substrate modification is definitely a goal uh, earlier in the stages of heart failure, definitely if we think it's progressing, uh, especially from a quality of life standpoint, as um, we were talking about, because these patients may get frequent shots. Thank you very much. Any comments? No. no. Okay. So I have gr great pleasure and honor to introduce esteemed and well-known guru in cardiology. Uh, professor of Cardiology, Chairman of the Department of Cardiology of Memorial Ankara Hospital, Professor Alioto. And his talk is atrial, atrial fibrillation ablation in patient with heart failure. Please, Professor. First of all, uh, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to the organizers uh, for the, this, this uh, invitation to such an important, uh, important scientific event. My task today is to discuss with you uh, the role of ablation uh, in patients with uh, heart failure and atrial fibrillation. 
Atrial fibrillation and heart failure are commonly uh, exist in the same patient. According to the EuroHeart survey, atrial fibrillation is present 42% of patients with heart failure and uh, in uh, uh, patients uh, with heart failure, uh, uh, atrial fibrillation occurs in 34% of the patients. Heart failure and atrial fibrillation are involved in a vicious pathophysiological interplay. Very, very interesting. Heart failure promotes AF mainly to the raised, uh, through the raised uh, filling, uh, uh, left ventricular filling pressures, abnormal uh, atrial uh, filling pressures, abnormal calcium handling, neurohumeral activation, and adrenergic stimulation. Conversely, AF promotes heart failure through rapid ventricular rates, heart rate, and pulse volume irregularity and loss of atrial kick. Well, therefore, it's a sort of chicken and egg story. We don't know which one is the first. AF causes 4.5 fold increase in hospital. Uh, hospitalization of heart failure patients, increase uh, in heart failure symptoms, and increase in mortality nearly 40%. Well, as indicated in the 22 ESCAF guidelines, heart failure is one of the major risk factors for the incident atrial fibrillation. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the excessive ventricular rate, irregular ventricular contractions, and usually the primary underlying cause of atrial fibrillation results in left ventricular dysfunction and heart failure in up to 30% of patients. Well, over the years, uh, the main strategy in patients with atrial fibrillation and heart failure has been or had been uh, the uh, rate control. And uh, of course, first drugs and rarely avenodal ablation and pacing. Um, as again uh, seen in the, um, as recommended in the ESC AF guidelines 2020, uh, you see the first line uh, uh, drug was uh, beta blockers both for the half ref and half ref and on top of that in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction patients none uh, the, uh, uh, NDCC calcium channel blockers can also be uh, given and uh, in the in the second line as you see here we have a beta blocker could be combined with digoxin and sometimes amio uh, in patients with HFPEF. Uh, but in patients with HFPEF, uh, digoxin, beta blockers, and also uh, non uh, dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers are uh, or can be combined. Well, uh, rate versus rhythm control in heart failure patients with AF. This had been uh, a, a, a really matter of controversy for many years. Of course, first several trials had tried uh, the uh, pharmacologic rhythm control with rate control. Among them, probably uh, uh, the AFCHF trial is a major, uh, the major. Uh, milestone and in this particular uh, study patients with clinically documented heart failure with an ejection fraction less than 35 percent were included and they uh, were randomized to pharmacologic rate versus rhythm control and the rhythm control uh, mainly uh, based on amiodarone 
And at the end of the study, there was no difference in uh, cardiovascular uh, death between the groups. And of course, it is not easy to understand, uh, but most probably uh, the adverse events related to the use of antiretmic drugs uh, uh, neutralize the beneficial effect of restoring and maintaining sinus rhythm in patients with heart failure. Therefore, uh, there was a need, unmet need, uh, to actually test uh, the impact of the rhythm control uh, on clinical outcomes and catheter ablation of AS has emerged as a potential strategy in patients with atrial fibrillation and initial results of catheter ablation versus rate control in heart failure patients were reported in small studies and early randomized control trials. And small number of patients in these trials and design of the studies limited the strength of the data. Well, over the years, heart failure, the presence of heart failure always uh, had been a worse uh, candidate uh, for uh, selection of patients uh, for AI publication. However, uh, as seen in the 2020 ESCAF guidelines, now uh, ablation, catheter ablation is part of the practice. Of course, uh, patient being placed uh, in the center. First patient's choice, and then uh, you may uh, go to uh, entire uh, drug trial. If uh, success, uh, uh, if unsuccessful, then uh, or recurrent AF, then catheter ablation. This is true both for HFPEF and HFREF. Uh, well, uh, here I have uh, trials, uh, randomized controlled trials of catheter ablation for the treatment of AF in patients with heart failure over the last. Uh, 10 years. I will mainly concentrate on the last two uh, camera MRI and Castle AF uh, trials. But before uh, switching to these two important trials, I would like to show you uh, the, a random uh, a meta analysis of the, uh, the previous uh, uh, studies, uh, which was published in 2018. And this uh, uh, particular meta-analysis included uh, 856 participants. And uh, as seen here, all cause mortality, heart failure readmission, and uh, functional class all improved with uh, ablation. And there was also a uh, positive a change in left ventricular ejection fraction and also left ventricular and systolic volume. Well, camera MRI study uh, is a very uh, important study. Uh, it's an MRI uh, uh, imaging study. And uh, uh, in this particular study, uh, catheter ablation versus medical rate control uh, uh, has been uh, really uh, tested uh, in uh, patients with atrial fibrillation and systolic dysfunction. Uh, and these patients, that is patients with idiopathic cardiomyopathy and persistent AF were randomized to catheter ablation or medical rate control and uh, CMR scan at baseline to assess the LV ejection fraction and LGE as surrogate for uh, VF. Uh, and then the majority had uh, long-standing uh, persistent atrial fibrillation, nearly 75%. The primary outcome was Left ventricular ejection fraction change at six months by repeat CMRI. And at the end, the ablation group, the better response compared to medical rate control. Those who were LGE negative, late gadolinium enhancement negative, 
at baseline had even better response compared to those who had the evidence of LGE. Well, what is more important was uh, this publication after four years, uh, four years from the first publication uh, of the camera MRI study, as seen here, uh, it has been shown that the, the uh, results of the, the initial results of the uh, camera MRI study was continuing after four years. Again, uh, as you see here, had uh, patients with cat ablation had a better left ventricular ejection fraction uh, as compared to the baseline at the end of uh, the four, fourth year. And also, uh, as you see here, those who had a LGE positive uh, negative at the baseline had better result even at four year follow up. Well, probably uh, one of uh, the major study in this context is Kasselaya uh, study. Therefore, I will give some more uh, insights into this important trial. This trial uh, included nearly 400 patients and the inclusion criteria were symptomatic paroxysmal or persistent diarrhea, failure or intolerance to uh, one or more uh, drug or unwillingness to take uh, antiarrhythmic uh, drug, uh, left ventricular ejection fraction less than 35% and neocardial cessation class over uh, two, ICD or CRTD with home monitoring capabilities already implanted, due to the primary or secondary prevention. So this is uh, important. Uh, these are important inclusion criteria. And primary endpoint was all-cause mortality plus worsening heart failure admissions. And there were a long list of predefined secondary endpoints. And shown here, very importantly, Probability of survival free of hospital admis admission. Uh, you see what was much, much better with uh, ablation. And hospitalization for uh, worsening heart failure was again uh, much better with uh, ablation. And all cause mortality also showed some differences and better result particularly in the uh, long-term run uh, with ablation. And in all subgroups, almost all subgroups, including uh, paroxysmal or persistent uh, CRTD presence or absence, and male or female, uh, uh, everything was uh, really in favor of ablation. Probably in patients uh, under the age of 65 uh, really benefited more and patients with a better uh, functional class benefited more and patients with better ejection fraction benefited more and uh, there was no difference in terms of uh, the uh, etiology of heart failure and in presence or absence of hypertension and digital use or beta blocker use. But there have been some concerns about the results of Castle AF. First of all, there is little information about the patients who were enrolled and how they were treated. Uh, the treatment groups were not balanced at the time of the randomization and all randomized patients were not included in the primary analysis and more data were excluded with the exclusion of uh, patients and number of primary endpoint events was too small. Uh, how can we interpret the data from Castle AF? Well, Castle AF builds on the accumulated negative evidence that catrablation may have benefits in patients with heart failure, but does not necessarily add clarity as to which patients with heart failure should be targeted for ablation. And the patients appear to be highly selected, uh, nearly uh, 13% uh, of the patients were ultimate, ultimately enrolled, and the cohort was highly heterogeneous 
as uh, indicated earlier, and the results of CAS layup may not apply to asymptomatic patients with heart failure, older patients, as well as patients with advanced heart failure. And complications of catch ablation may also be higher in patients with heart failure compared to general cohorts of patients undergoing AF ablation, uh, as in Kessel AF, 7.8%, while in a contemporary cohort, 2.3%. Uh, the uh, major question, of course, is uh, whether the results of Kessel AF could be generalized or not. And this question was tried to be answered in a, um, a, co in a very large US administrative database. And uh, they uh, identified nearly 290,000 patients uh, with atrial fibrillation and heart failure, and of whom uh, 7,500 were uh, treated with AF ablation and 280,000 patients uh, with medical therapy alone. And what they found was very interesting. Here you see in all patients, uh, the uh, cumulative incidence of uh, recurrence was really much better in ablated patients as compared to the drug treated patients. And uh, the same primary endpoint was uh, achieved in those when they analyzed those who were eligible for Kessel AF. Those who failed to meet inclusion for Kessel AF showed the same results beneficial, significantly beneficial effect of. Uh, of um, ablation as compared to medical therapy. But the situation was completely contrary in those who excluded from Castellaia. No difference between the groups, namely ablation or medical therapy uh, in this uh, group who were excluded from the Castellaia. So they concluded that the benefit associated with ablation appears to be more modest in practice than probably reported in the Kessel AF trial, but the benefit was there. Here I have uh, a final meta-analysis, uh, which uh, was published after the, um, uh, the publication of Kessel AF. So included all major uh, trials uh, which uh, have been uh, uh, reported in uh, within the last 10 years, included AATA seed study, Kessler and camera MRI. Please note that uh, in this important meta-analysis, also everything really favors uh, radio frequency ablation or ablation in general. Um, in terms of improvement in left ventric ejection fraction and six minute walk test, and also a decrease in all cause mortality and heart failure hospitalizations, as you see here, was much better in patients with uh, catheter ablation as compared to medical therapy. Well, uh, I've been uh, re reporting the results of the major trials. Uh, related to patients with HFREF and atrial fibrillation. Here I have uh, two important <clears throat> study, this time on patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction and atrial fibrillation. This first study published in 2018 included, uh, it was a retrospective study, included 230 patients with heart failure who underwent air publication. Um, endpoint was, uh, endpoints included adverse events, symptoms, functional class, freedom from recurrent atrial arrhythmias. Well, uh, definitely uh, uh, the uh, change in functional class was 
much much better uh, with uh, with uh, ablation and there was no difference between half ref and half ref patients and freedom from uh, atrial tachyarrhythmia uh, same result and uh, in the follow up uh, and ablation outcomes by, by by heart failure type again was the same there was no difference between half ref and half ref therefore uh, the uh, what we have received or obtained from uh, what we achieved uh, by ablation in half ref patients can be probably um, uh, generalized to patients with uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. This is another study, uh, again, included uh, 374 PVI patients, of whom 35 uh, were uh, met the criteria for HEFPEF. And uh, it was shown a uh, freedom from atrial tachyarrhythmia at one year, 80% and improvement in new heart, new heart association plus and importantly enough regression of diastolic dysfunction at 12 months that is uh, and that means uh, left ventricular reverse remodeling and also complete resolution of health path in uh, nearly uh, half of the patients and multivariate log logistic regression analysis showed that the absence of atrial tachyarrhythmia recurrence was an independent predictor of the recovery from HFF and with a hazard ratio of 11. Can you imagine such an important and remarkable, remarkable uh, prediction uh, by uh, ablation in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? And importantly enough, in this particular uh, study, um, cryo-balloon ablation was also uh, shown to be a promising alternative uh, approach for uh, atrial fibrillation ablation. Well, uh, whether the effectiveness of catch ablation of AF uh, matters according to uh, the heart failure etiology. This retrospective observational study, uh, court study, uh, who uh, in patients with heart failure who underwent AF ablation, compared the outcomes based on heart failure etiology and included 242 patients and nearly 29% was were ischemic. And patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy uh, were found to be younger, more often female, and at higher left ventricular ejection fraction. And at the end, uh, there were significant improvements in functional and symptomatic status with no difference in freedom from AF recurrence at 12 months. Therefore, uh, the heart failure etiology does not matter and does not really cause any harm or any difference uh, in the uh, outcomes uh, of the uh, ablation of AF uh, in patients with heart failure. Well, if we come back to the uh, guidelines, as you see, uh, the, the recommendations from the uh, uh, last consensus uh, document of the major arrhythmia, global arrhythmia societies, uh, almost all uh, uh, groups from paroxysmal to persistent or long-standing persistent, uh, 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 the, uh, the, uh, the recommendation in class two uh, being 2A in paroxysmal and persistent AF and 2B in patients with uh, long-standing persistent AF. And if we look at the heart failure in this uh, particular uh, recommendations. Uh, it says uh, it is 2A and it is reasonable to use similar indications for AF ablation in selected patients with heart failure as in patients without heart failure. 
This is very, very important and is the major paradigm shift that I really uh, mentioned at the beginning of my talk. Uh, well, here you see uh, in uh, patients uh, with structural heart disease, uh, heart failure patients really are really um, handled as patients with no or minimal uh, structural heart disease. And if there is no heart failure, so uh, antiarrhythmic drug and catheter ablation, but if there's heart failure, again, the same approach, but if it is due to the tachycardiomyopathy, uh, then uh, uh, catheter ablation is a first uh, choice. And as you see here, uh, the, uh, heart, the patients with tachycardiomyopathy are included in four uh, groups in which uh, it's reasonable to consider ablation as first-line therapy. Well, uh, this slide shows us how uh, the scenery has been changed over the years and reflected into the main guidelines. Uh, please uh, note that in 2014 uh, guidelines, uh, see uh, the uh, medication or medical therapy is the first choice and then if fails catheter ablation but here in from the 2006 from 2016 and catheter ablation <coughs> has become class 2a recommendation and in 2020 uh, this uh, recommendation has been much more robust. And you see here uh, in, uh, in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, whether it is paroxysmal or persistent AF, then patient choice is in the center. And uh, you may try anti drugs. If the drugs fail, then, uh, then uh, you go for uh, catheter ablation, uh, but you can also choose catheter ablation as a first line therapy based on the patient's choice. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, also in patients with tachycardiomyopathy. If, of course, uh, you start anti drug, and if drug really works, uh, then you may continue uh, with uh, anti drugs. Well, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my final words uh, include first, what is clear from all the trials is that heart failure populations with atrial fibrillation are highly heterogeneous, and this can have significant impact on clinical outcomes. Compared with standard drug therapy, catheter ablation in patients with FREF reduces all cause mortality and heart failure hospitalizations and improves left ventricular ejection fraction, functional capacity, and quality of life. An AF ablation in patients with heart failure may be safe and effective, but most data in the setting are derived from experienced centers. And based on the results of completed clinical trials of AF ablation in heart failure patients who tend to have the least benefit from catheter ablation appear to have a higher neocardial association class, longer duration of AF, and extensive structural remodeling. Ablation may not be appropriate in patients with advanced heart failure, poor functional status, or with extensive structural remodeling. We must also keep in mind that available data on catheter ablation heart failure patients have been derived from populations aged 50 to 60 years, Extrapolation to older age and more fragile populations should be done with caution. The development of patient-oriented approaches with improved risk certification tools to identify the patients most likely to benefit from catheter ablation will be a great value to reduce unnecessary procedures in patients unlikely to benefit. 
I thank you for your attention. So, Professor Otto, thank you very much for very interesting information. And there is very interesting question from audience. Yeah. Young patient with several metal stenosis with atrial fibrillation. Do you recommend the ablation? Um, well, this is a uh, really very interesting question. Um, as I mentioned in my last words for heart failure, uh, if there is a remarkable remodeling in the left atrium. So uh, I'm talking about a very large uh, left atrium, in the, you know, very advanced fibrosis. Uh, so of course there is no place for ablation uh, in even uh, you know, in mitostenosis. It's the same thing. Um, uh, but if uh, the left atrium is small enough and uh, well, there is not much uh, advanced remodeling, then you may try, you may give a chance to the patient. What, uh, well, well uh, some years ago, we, we tried uh, to ablate the atrial fibrillation by cryoablation uh, during the, the balloon mitovalvoplasty. So when we uh, performed balloon mitovalvoplasty, uh, following the procedure, we just continued with uh, the cryoablation. In fact, in the midterm follow-up, uh, the recurrence of atrial fibrillation was uh, really less uh, in those uh, in whom we performed cryoablation uh, as compared to the uh, cryoablation without uh, ablation. But of course, this was a very selected group of patients usually small uh, left atrium and, uh, you know, fibrotic mitral stenosis, not so advanced uh, valvular disease. So otherwise, uh, I, I wouldn't recommend uh, uh, ablation, uh, air ablation for uh, valvular disease as, you know, you have a diseased left atrium. Yeah. Thank you. Farid, maybe some comment from your side? Yes, for about, about these questions, I would like also to comment because uh, if you, we have a severe uh, mitral stenosis and this patient is, uh, should go in two directions, either to balloon valvuloplasty or to surgical uh, valve replacement. So in both options, in both ways, we have to offer a patient these options uh, either uh, RF ablation during the surgical open surgical procedure, which is very, very effective in this group of patients. And most of them remain in the sinus rhythm in the long term. And if the patients choose the balloon valvuloplasty way, it's a uh, good option, as Professor Aleoto mentioned, to do a hybrid procedure that like balloon valvuloplasty and percutaneous either balloon or uh, the RF technique using balloon or RF techniques. I, I also uh, in the same uh, opinion. Uh, well, just um, I shouldn't mention the surgical option. Of course, uh, the patients who undergo uh, to uh, mitral replacement, uh, of course, if again, uh, the left atrium is not too, too big and there is not so advanced remodeling, uh, definitely. Uh, uh, ablation during surgery should be tried. Interesting. What about cardiac MR in this group of patients as in pre-investigation of this patient, patient with heart for failure? the scar? Excuse you me? mean in patients with heart failure? Yes, in uh, heart failure, uh, AF ablation, young patients, mitral stenosis and etc in this field? You mean uh, this is structural uh, heart disease patient? Well, of course, if you remember the camera AF uh, trial, uh, it shows that if there is fibrosis or, you know, uh, uh, LGE, late gadolinium enhancement as a surrogate for uh, fibrosis, uh, the success uh, of the, um, uh, pro, you know, uh, interventions uh, is not good. 
as compared to those who do not have any uh, fibrosis or LGE. And this is true uh, even at five, four years follow-up. This is a very, very important clue uh, that, you know, if you have fibrosis, extensive fibrosis, then of course you may expect less success. And now uh, what we do is we uh, actually um, uh, do low voltage mapping uh, with high density uh, you know, mapping techniques. And then we try to identify the fibrotic areas as well uh, during the 3D mapping. And then we try to you know, just uh, uh, modify the uh, substrate as well. And I think this is a very, very useful approach uh, and um, uh, you know, in, in uh, long-term uh, follow-up as has been shown in, in uh, follow-up studies as well. And trying to avoid another atrial tachycardias and <coughs> left atrial flutters. After yeah, of course. Ablation and yes. et cetera, okay. Thank you very much. Maybe some comment? Farid, from your side? No. Thank you very much. So, Professor Roto, thank you very much for joining us. If you have thank time, you. we know that you are, from, you are now in hospital. If you have time, join us, please, more. Thank yeah, you. I, I have one, one more uh, yes. uh, case to do, so I, I will be uh, with you until the end of the session. Thank you very much. Now... Uh, let me remind you, dear colleagues, that for this conference we have prepared all lectures in two languages, English and Russian. Link to Russian lecture are available in our chat, so you can follow our chat and you, you can see it. Also, all videos will be available after the conference on our YouTube channel. Please follow. And let me announce this in Russian language. Уважаемые коллеги, у нас Наша конференция проходит на двух языках. Это русский язык и английский язык. Если вы хотите послушать вы видео на русском языке, в кажд, кажд, линк каждого видео в нашем YouTube-канале вы просто можете нажать этот линк и послушать все лекции на, на русском. Поэтому, пожалуйста, можете переключаться на русский канал и послушать на русском. Кто считает нужным послушать на английском, пожалуйста, so, dear friends, and now, last but not least, our final talk for today. It's not very typical presentation for heart failure conference, but I'm sure it will be useful and interesting for you. Allow me to introduce Tarlan Useinov, who specialized in advertising and digital marketing. We will, he will talk about Instagram marketing for doctors. It's very important for us. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Tarlan Usainov and I would like to say thank you to hosts of this event for giving me a chance to talk to you about what I do professionally, which is the digital marketing. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you about um, marketing Instagram, or in other words, we can say what should a doctor know about Instagram in just uh, 20 minutes. Uh, so what I'm doing, I'm uh, putting, my, uh, putting my timer and I'll make sure that uh, I'll try not to overcome this 20 minutes. Just a few words about myself. Uh, I have a marketing experience. I've been doing strategy, advertising, creative, uh, content creation, um, business development for maybe last 15 years and I've been working with uh, brands like Coca-Cola, Unilever, Sony, KSL, FS, Bayer, pretty much most of the, uh, pretty much most of the biggest clients, international clients in the region. You can always connect with me on Instagram and I'll be happy to answer any of, you, any of your questions if you have any. So let's start. <laughs> How can I benefit from Instagram? This question could really come to your mind. And uh, one of the ways how you could benefit from Instagram is uh, to start your own practice. Uh, you can do it offline. You can be, create your own, um, own clinic or your own office 
or you can actually change the way how you do business and shift it totally to online. This guy, his name is Boris Bril. He's a Ukrainian doctor, and he's taking care of his Instagram pretty well. You can connect with him on WhatsApp. You can connect on, on Telegram. He has a very nice website, and on this website, he constantly creates content and really shows that what he's doing and how well he's doing that. Another reason how, why a doctor could want uh, an Instagram, invest into Instagram, his resources, his money, is to support the current employee or to become a part of something big. They say that a good doctor cannot work at a bad hospital and uh, hospitals know about it. Becoming an influencer. Influencers are, I would say, number one thing right now in digital marketing. And the influencers, they do partnership programs with brands. They have the uh, opportunity actually to do less practice, to do less nine to five job, and to do more education, community building, social projects, or selling their own product or services online. Everybody knows this guy, his name is Komarovsky. He's, I would say, maybe one of the most known and popular uh, pediatricians, not just in Russia, in Russian speaking countries, but also in the world. This guy is amazing. And I personally consider him a millionaire of 21st century because they say you are a millionaire when you have a power to influence million people. And uh, Mr. Kamarovsky has this power. Also, a doctor could want Instagram just to create the online presence, just to say, hey, here I am. You know, we know that what happens after the first time you meet with a person or with a doctor, you go and search Google him, you Instagram search him, or you look for his website. So what stops most of us or most of you from creating the uh, Instagram and investing the resources and time to it? One of the biggest, biggest reasons uh, for that is the low marketing and PR knowledge. Of course, you guys are not uh, marketeers. This is not what you do. One of the doctors told me once that, listen, I know how to be a doctor. I know how to save lives, but uh, I do not know. I'm not this marketing guy, you know, like uh, this isn't just not me. How do I know? Another reason uh, uh, is uh, doctors saying that, you know what, all this Instagram, I don't need this. Word of mouth. Word of mouth has been working for ages. It will work for me. Well, take a look at the numbers. One billion people are using Instagram monthly. Half a billion people watch stories. Instagram users spend an average half an hour per day going through the feed and at least 200 million of them go and check out the brands, the doctor pages, officials, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Let's skip this. So if you still have a question that's saying that, why do I need Instagram word of mouth works for me? Let's go back to Mr. Kamarovsky and really uh, feel the power that he has. And he has a lot of power. He has uh, more than 9 million followers on, on his Instagram, and that's just Instagram. This guy is, he has a huge power, and a lot of brands, a lot of products are really looking forward to cooperate with him. Lack of knowledge or resources. I know nothing about what to post, how to post. I do not know how to take photos, and I do not want to pay for that. I, I'm, I'm not planning to do that. This could be another reason why why Instagram is not that popular for you. So how do I start? Where, where do we begin? If we take a look at the uh, in, uh, Instagram uh, marketing or digital marketing or actually any kind of a marketing, you have to think of the three stages. You have to first think of your strategy. Strategy is going to be the place, the step where you think about your goal, where you want to go, where do you want to be? Strategy is the place where you think about how different you are from everybody else. What is your mission and also what is your audience? Packaging. Packaging is actually a making thing. It's a metaphorical expression. When you package your ideas, your messages, your communication, and you do it through design, you do it through ideas for content creation, you do it through just talking to your followers on Instagram. And promotion, the third step. When you know what to do, you know how to do it, 
you have to take this and deliver to your audience. Because if you just post your photos or videos on your Instagram and do nothing after that, most probably it's not going to work. So today we're going to cover most of the first and the second uh, step, not most of it, but some of the points and uh, not very much the third one. Let's start with goal and mission. So let's understand, am I an influencer? Am I a professional? Am I a business? Do I do a business through Instagram? Am I a part of something bigger? Am I part of the clinic or a hospital? Or I don't need all that, I just need kind of a resume online. I just need people to be able to find me, take a look at me and kind of understand, get an idea of what I'm doing and how I'm doing. Another thing we really need to think, you need to think, is about your uniqueness. You do best what you love the most. And this, is, this translates to your audience very easily. You know, uh, in NLP, Neuro Linguistic Pro uh, Programming, they say that if person lies or does something that really doesn't like, whatever he says, nobody's going to believe it. And this is exactly what I mean by that. Think about what you do the best. Think how you are different from everybody else. Yes, there are many cardiologists, there are many arrhythmologists, there are many doctors, but there should be something that makes you unique. Audience, language, specialization, charisma, good lookingness, like the way how you look. Trust me, it all could be uniqueness that you could use and leverage in Instagram. Audience. You really need to know who you're talking to, because depending on who you talk to, from that going to depend what you're going to tell them. If that's patients that come to your uh, to your Instagram, they need to read some reviews. They really need to know where you are, what kind of services you provide. Whereas the peers, the doctors, they come for something else. Pharma device companies and brands they come for something else. So really identify. Who are the people who you want to be your audience? Who are those people who sit in front of you and who you talk to? Authenticity. This is what we spoke about a little bit before. Authentic. Because deeper connection leads to dedicated, loving, loyal, and emotionally investing, invested uh, following. If we take a look at that and try to understand, okay, I have to be authentic, what does it mean? It means to be simple. It means not to overcomplicate. It means to be funny if you are funny and serious if you are serious. Meaning that if you're just a funny personality, if you are very charismatic and you're very, how do you say, you know, like a very active, be that. If you're serious, if you're really inside the serious, do the serious thing. But do not try to be someone else. I really like this example of, uh, that, uh, that was shot just yesterday. It was shot just the day before. Take a look of how relaxed and how, uh, how very simple the video is. Пожалуйста, сверьте ваши часовые пояса, чтобы начать именно вовремя нашу конференцию. Charismatic, uh, very simple, showing what is around. It's not like, you know, like a, the TV, the traditional government TV type of the, you know, like a, 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 of the shots that you get, where you sit very straight and you go straight, you talk straight to the camera. Simple, relaxed. How often should I post? This question really comes very often. I hear it very often. Well, let me tell you, uh, there have been many, many, many studies. And for example, on your left, you can say which day have the best Instagram engagement. And there's been a big study that says that Wednesday is the best day to make posts on Instagram. But actually, if you take a look, yes, Wednesday is the best day, but the difference is very little. I think every day, any day, several stories per day, post a day. Uh, if you really do not know anything about Instagram, if you really are just a beginner, there are a lot of very good resources that you can use. 
Skillshare is an English-based uh, website that allows you to access hundreds of courses, Instagram, marketing, design, photography, copywriting, anything for just $10 per month. Very, uh, very similar is the udemy.com. Probably you heard about this. This is the place, this is the website where you can buy different uh, courses. You can buy again courses on Instagram and you pay per course. And here you can see some Russian language, Russian-based language resources like Practicum with Yandex, Netology or Skillbox. Google search, it's amazing. You buy, you pay very little, and you can spend it, you can learn it when you're free, you can learn it from your smartphone and in the evening when you're free. Now, let's talk about what to post. There are many things that doctors can do, but here is the summary, just a little summary that I put together. Tops and lists. What is the tops and list? Every time we hear something like top 10 things or top 10 movies that you have to watch, you want to take a look at that. Lists, uh, biggest myth, uh, biggest mistakes that patients do, or the best, um, I don't know, activity that you can do for your heart. Patients' feedback, uh, what the patients write about you. FAQ, frequently asked questions. The questions that patients ask from you every time that they come to your, uh, to your office. Challenge your peers, photos of you and your staff. Instagram live um, broadcasting with your friends or with your peers, with other doctors. Some sciencey stuff um, could not hurt and uh, sharing your reality, sharing what you do every day. Let's go in details about this a little bit. Sharing patients' feedback is one of the most powerful tools to build your online reputation. It shows all the researches that are being done on the internet. And uh, if, those, if those feedbacks, if those um, reviews are real and sincere, they can, they can do a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, benefit to you. Another thing which you can do, as I said before, is to make this Instagram live with your peers. I'm sure you have a lot to discuss. And the, nowadays, you don't have really much chance to go out to, and to meet with, person in, uh, with, the, with your peer, with your friend, colleague in person. Instagram live, amazing thing. Instagram promotes them. So once you do the live, you'll see how many people will, will start joining you. Challenge, challenge your, your peers. Uh, do, do, do the cardiogram, do, 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 some, do some task for them, ask them a question, a tricky question, test their knowledge, kind of challenge them. Maybe, not maybe, but definitely do a little a bit of bragging. Tell about yourself. If you have diplomas, Instagram is definitely a place to put your diploma at. Create the highlight and put all of your diplomas over there. It really will work. Please, <laughs> no blood, really. There's been many, many people have been asking me this question. Should I post the, sport, post the surgery? Should I really show how I do this? No blood. All the researches and all the feedback from the audience tells that, yes, it kind of sounds interesting, but people don't like it. People will not be coming to your Instagram account if they see very, very vivid uh, uh, kind of a medical stuff. Another thing what you can do, you can find some beauty in what you do. You know, like if you see some artwork, if you see some picture, some photo or some painting that is uh, very next, very close to what you do, uh, share it. And definitely, definitely do a professional profile photo. No, or no self uh, camera. Do it, make, a pro make it a project for yourself. Look around, ask around, ask me, and I will recommend you a good and not very expensive uh, photographer who can make a very nice profile picture for you. You will, you will see your life changes after you, have, uh, after you change your profile photo. Show some irony, and especially the self-irony, the, uh, the, the irony to yourself, to what you do, to how much you work or how much you study. Share what inspires you. If you're reading a book, post it on Instagram and share your thoughts about that. 
I'm sure that your colleagues and peers or even the patients will be, will be very glad to, to, to hear and to read about. And maybe if you're, if, if you're a good dancer, you can try explaining the heart rhythm to a six-year-old. I really love this example. Let, let, let's take a look at this. And uh, uh, the, another thing what uh, I want to mention is that definitely change your profile to the business profile if you haven't done so. Uh, most of the people when they register on Instagram, they uh, just continue the way it is but they do not know that this profile is the personal profile, is the profile that has some limitations. If you want to do Instagram marketing, if you want to do serious Instagram marketing, turn to uh, uh, Instagram business profile. For that, you will need to create a separate Facebook page. You can search, uh, you can search how to do this on YouTube. It's very easy. If you do not know 15 minutes of your time, you will be done. But once you do that, you will get much more capabilities on what you post and how people see that. And also most importantly, the statistics, the, the analytics of the audience. Remember we were talking about the audience before, really how important it is in understanding who you talk to and what you uh, tell to these people. These statistics and this analytics can help you a lot. It can give you idea of uh, how many men and uh, what is the percentage of men and female that come to your to your Instagram account? It can give you gender, age. It can give you uh, city. It can give you a country. Uh, many things that can be taken from this uh, from these statistics, and I highly recommend and I highly recommend to do that. I think I am right on time. Uh, my presentation is uh, is over. And if you have any questions, I will be really happy to answer. I know that the, the topic is very big uh, and uh, I could uh, put just a few, uh, few main points into this presentation, but I will be happy to answer any of your questions through Instagram or here in, uh, in the studio. Have a, good, uh, have a good day and thank you. Darlan, thank you very much to joining us in studio, in Future Health Studio. Thank you for inviting. Thank you for inviting. Uh, and we have one interesting question from audience. Dr. Ozjan is asking, could you also make some comments regarding responsibilities of doctor in social media and legal obli obligations? I wish. I wish I could do uh, comments, uh, but what shows the experience that different, different countries have different uh, legal uh, regulations. And uh, moreover, the region that we are in, the Central Asia, the Caucasus, uh, even the Russian and uh, post-Soviet Union countries, even I'm sure some uh, European countries, uh, Southern European countries, do not have this strict uh, legal uh, framework uh, in which they regulate whatever is happening online. Uh, some countries are a little bit further than the others, but uh, specifically for Kazakhstan, probably not. The market of uh, Instagram influencers doing business online is still kind of shaping. So the legal system is uh, trying to catch up. Of course, in Turkey, uh, it's a little bit more advanced, but from my expectation, uh, doctors specifically are more relying on kind of a personal, uh, personal feelings of uh, their own responsibilities, uh, feeling and understanding of what is good and what is wrong, rather than on very strict uh, kind of legal framework. Of course, in Europe uh, and in states, uh, it's much more uh, it's much more rigid. But uh, this country, this part of the world, is still shaping its uh, legal framework. Which you know what I will tell you that it's uh, uh, it has the positive and also the negative side to it. Very interesting. Everything you mentioned sounds very interesting, Tarlan, but can usual doctor like me 
uh, do some content and beautiful, interesting content in Instagram? Interesting, yes. Uh, I'm sure, yes. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful depends on uh, depends on how uh, how well how how well do you know your smartphone? How much uh, experience you had taking photos or really playing with uh, uh, with uh, with your smartphone? Um, there are several there are several platforms there are several websites that really allow you to for very little t money monthly fee like ten dollars fifteen dollars to get access to really good courses that within four hours growing can make you from the average doctor as you said into very very advanced uh, doctor you will be able uh, to shoot very nice uh, photos, you will have much better understanding of um, uh, of what to do, what not to do. Uh, of course, this is one option, and the second option is uh, to hire a professional and uh, uh, and uh, to advance with uh, with professional. Thank you very much, but we should not for forget about heart failure treatment, also. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. Yes. <laughs> yes. So. Thank you very much for your joining us in our studio. Uh, so, dear friends, dear colleagues, esteemed speakers, thank you very much for joining today's conference. Uh, we believe that sharing the experience and knowledge among the cardiologist community is a powerful, useful tool for the professional growing. And today's conference was for about heart failure treatment. Thank you all speakers, all participants to your participation. I wish you best wishes and see you soon in one and a half month in this, ch in this studio, in our YouTube channel. Uh, and we, are, we, will cre we will try to create better, better contents for you. Thank you very much. Good luck with that. Thank you very much, Tarlan. Good luck. Congratulations. Bye.